Hello, and welcome to Wellness Wednesday with 3W. Wellness Wednesday is sponsored by 3W Medical for Women, a nonprofit medical clinic offering free of charge or low cost reproductive health services to women in the Seattle area, regardless of income or insurance status. 3W does not profit off of the reproductive health choices women make. The information shared in this podcast is the opinion of the speaker or speakers. Medical information is not intended as individual medical consultation, but for general education only. Always consult your own health professional for personalized advice regarding medical decisions. And if you're in the Seattle area, consider making an appointment to consult with us. I'm Helen Nguyen, CEO and co-founder of 3W Medical for Women and the host of today's podcast. Hi there, Wellness Wednesday listeners. Gosh, it feels like it's been a while since I've been in the studio. We did a podcast a couple of times about self-care, and that is exactly what I did recently. I took some downtime to to do some self-care. I took some downtime to potty train my two-year-old which is a whole experience. Moms out there, I don't know how you do it. So I I took some downtime for myself and it was just really, really wonderful. Uh, And I'm so appreciative to my board for encouraging me to do that. And then I also had a birthday and I also went to see my best friend in Houston. So it's been a whirlwind of downtime and just me time. And it's been just so, so good for me. So self-care, it is a thing and I encourage you guys to do it. But uh, I'm so reinvigorated to be back in the studio. We have a guest speaker here with us. Her name is April Thomas. She is going to be talking to us about a really important topic, gestational diabetes and nutrition during pregnancy. And I'm just so grateful for April. She reached out to us and said, hey, I know a lot about this topic. Can I be of service? And we're like, yes, come into our studio. So hi, April. Thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, thank you. So how long have you been in this world, in this gestational diabetes world, and what makes you so passionate about this topic? Well, I have been in the field of diabetes since 2002. I started in diabetes research with lifestyle study looking at um, diet and exercise reducing risk of diabetes, which was really interesting. And then after that, I moved on to um, clinical work in a hospital and started working in pregnancy. And Mm -hmm. so I'd say that was about 11 years later. So yeah, I guess maybe 11 years or so I've been in the field of diabetes and pregnancy in particular. And it's great to be able to work with a population of women when Mm -hmm. they're very motivated to care for themselves. Yes. Uh, You talked about Mm self-care and I think it's unfortunate, but us as women sometimes need an excuse to care for ourselves. Yes. Um, (laughs) Yes. It wasn't until people around me were like, you need a break that I was like, Okay, that sounds nice. Yeah, it's so So. important. So in pregnancy, it is kind of like research in the sense that it's a special population and they're very motivated Mm -hmm. and we get to care for these women and have oftentimes weekly visits with them throughout their pregnancy, which you don't get to do in healthcare a lot, as you know. Yes. So it's just a very special time. And at the other end is a beautiful baby. And uh, yeah, it's it's great to see all the hard work pay off and and maybe even learn um, lifestyle behaviors that they can carry after pregnancy to take care of themselves and their mm-hmm. families. So let's let's take a step back and ask kind of some basic questions. What is gestational diabetes and what are some warning signs that someone that isn't pregnant is should be aware of before they get pregnant? So gestational diabetes does occur in pregnancy related to the hormones that the placenta makes. And usually that occurs during the late second, early third trimester. So it truly occurs in pregnancy and then it goes away um, after delivery. Oh, okay. Um, So it's just related to pregnancy hormones. Okay. As far as risk factors for gestational diabetes or what might be some of the things to worry about perhaps or just to kind of be aware of. Definitely trying to see a doctor once a year just Mm -hmm. is a good idea. Making sure that you don't maybe have diabetes before you're pregnant. If that's the case, then that's really helpful to know. I would say some of the risk factors of developing diabetes and gestational diabetes, actually, there's there's quite a few. I wrote them down because there are so many. So there's certain ethnic groups that are at higher risk for developing diabetes and gestational diabetes. Asians, African Americans, Hispanics, Mm. um, Native Americans, or Pacific Mm. Islanders have a higher incidence 
of gestational diabetes. Oh, that is so interesting. Um, the population I work with, I would say maybe 70% are Asian or Indian patients. That mm-hmm. is so interesting. Yeah, so it's very prevalent. Oftentimes people think diabetes develops maybe if you're overweight, and sometimes that does occur. Mm-hmm. Um, it's certainly a risk factor. It increases your insulin resistance, yes, yeah. which is aggravated by those uh, placental hormones, so that certainly makes that worse. But it's not just about weight. There's a lot of different factors, particularly ethnicity. Family history plays mm-hmm. a huge part. So I'd say those are the biggest risk factors. Age plays a part. So as you get older, you're more likely to develop gestational diabetes. If you've had a large baby in the past, that makes you more likely to develop gestational diabetes. Okay. Is it is it about our diet? Is mm-hmm. it the the rice that we eat for Asians? Well, yes. And I would say, again, I don't think it causes it. Okay. Usually there's a family history. Family history. You know, so yeah. most of my patients have mothers or fathers or grandparents that yeah. have had diabetes. Diabetes, yeah. However, many of my patients are vegetarian. Oh. And again, usually a lot of rice. Yes. Yeah. It yeah. Is, yeah. And, you know, a vegetarian, again, coming from research, there's vegetarian diets can definitely lower risk of diabetes Mm -hmm, if mm -hmm. they're high fiber. You know, high fiber, healthy fats. Mm -hmm. If it's not done right, then it can make blood sugars worse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So someone like me, I'm using myself as an example, as I do a lot of the times in these podcasts. So I have a family history of Uh of diabetes. My grandpa on my mom's side. My dad's side, we don't really know too much, but I have insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. So would I have a higher risk of of Getting diabetes. Yes, absolutely. If I were cut pregnant? Yes, oh. absolutely. Oh, wow. Yeah. My yeah. sister is has been pregnant twice, and she had to take those glucose yes. tests. Yes. And she's passed them every time. Yes. So she probably doesn't have as much insulin-resistant issues yes. than me. Probably. Do you happen to know, is she like physically active? Or? Yeah, she's pretty physically uh-huh. active. Yes, she's much thinner than mine. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, um, going into the research, it was interesting because, again, a lot of it does seem to play into, you know, family history and yeah. genetics. But I yeah. I did. I, I did a little bit of research preparing for this. And mm-hmm. actually, the one thing that I found as far as if you are at risk for gestational diabetes, a way to lower your risk is exercise. Oh. Yeah, so that seems to be almost the biggest factor in, you know, perhaps reducing risk of gestational diabetes. Yeah, so. yeah. But well, you're right. Weight plays a part. Yes. You know, that insulin resistance is made worse by mm-hmm. by extra weight. And and do you see, have you seen a, a trend of more pregnant women getting GD? Yes. You know, and I think over the last, you know, again, 10 or 11 or 12 or 15 years that I've been in the field, the way that we diagnose it has changed a little bit. Okay. We're screening. When I was pregnant with my first son, who is 17 now, I did not do the glucose tolerance test because I was low risk, Mm. right? I don't have a family history. Mm -hmm. I'm Caucasian. I wasn't overweight. And so I wasn't even screened. Now I believe we screen everybody. Oh, wow. And a lot of the doctors that we work with actually screen patients in the first trimester, Mm -hmm. which is not common because, as I said, this usually develops in the, you know, late second, early third trimester. But by screening these patients, we're finding a lot of patients that might have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes and they weren't aware of it. Wow. Yeah. We have, in the place where I work, we probably have, we're not, none of us are full-time, which is wonderful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but I think we have five practitioners and we're, we're very, very busy and very, very full. It does seem like it's just, it, it seems like it's being diagnosed more. And again, I don't know if it's just because we're screening better or, mm-hmm. you know, if it's just because our population is becoming higher risk. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It could be a variety of yeah. things. I mean, it could be in the water. Yeah. I mean, you don't I even, know. No, we don't know. Yeah. We right? don't know. Yeah. 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 And again, so coming from research, it's so hard to tease out. Yes. You know, when, especially in pregnancy, you yeah. know, um, people are wondering what might cause some of the things that occur and it's yeah. really hard to tease out. Yeah. Do you yeah. get a lot of, you know, you, you say you are interacting with these these moms that are very motivated, right? Mm-hmm. Is there like a grieving process of when you have to tell someone mm-hmm. yeah. you didn't pass your glucose test? Yes. And, you know, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm not the one that has to tell them that. I just okay. provide the education okay. once they're diagnosed. Diabetes in general is a, it's a very psychological condition mm-hmm. because, and our patients in particular, and, and women in particular, I think we feel like if we could just work harder, then we could make it go away. Or Mm -hmm. or make it better. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that's somewhat of a fallacy is, you know, that a lot of the patients come in and they think, if I follow the diet and I exercise, I won't need to use medicine. 
you know, and unfortunately, sometimes the hormones that the baby makes, they override all the hard work that the mom is doing. And Mm. they certainly, their blood sugars are easier to control, but still they need a little help. Not everybody, of course, but I think that's very hard. And I think that's the hardest for some women to come to is Mm -hmm. that no matter how hard they're working, yeah. Sometimes things are still out of their control. And I, I tell my new parents anyways, you know, this is what I've learned as a parent is it's just one of the many ways that I learned that I have some control over my children. But, <laughs> you know, I, it's taught me a lot to, you know, just be humble and yeah. <laughs> realize that, yeah, I guess, you know, this is a little bit out of my control sometimes. Right, right. Yeah. Well, it's a scary stage. You know, it's a vulnerable stage when you just find out that you're pregnant and now there's this layered issue that's on top of that and you feel oh gosh I caused this or you know I I can just imagine I've never been pregnant but I can just imagine that the panic of is this going to hurt my baby is this something I'm going to have to live with forever is this going to happen every time it's like you want to birth your child and give them the best first start and then now they have this thing that they're carrying with them you know do you do you find those types of conversation comes up or yes Uh, you know and again I I think sometimes it happens initially you Mm -hmm. know at the first visit Mm -hmm. or maybe the second visit when the blood sugars are a little high and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're they're trying their their hardest. Sometimes it happens later. So if a patient has been doing this, you know, maybe they were a patient that was diagnosed early Mm -hmm. and they've been doing this for, you know, 30 30 weeks Mm -hmm. and they're feeling a little burnt out because they've been working so hard. And again, I think with gestational diabetes, you know, we do ask our patients to check their blood sugars four times a day. First thing when they wake up and one hour after they eat their biggest meals of the day. And again, mm-hmm. it kind of feels like a report card, I think, for the yeah. patients yeah. when they have to do that. It's like one more thing. It is. <laughs> and and again, you know, it's hard because we want the baby to be healthy. You know, we really need to know what the blood sugars are doing. But also, I, I don't like the idea that the patient has to feel like they're they're being graded on right on what they're, they're really trying hard to do. So mm-hmm. a lot of it is just kind of listening and trying to meet you know, our our patients where they're at. Mm -hmm. But it is challenging. And I recognize that. And and I tell them, you know, a lot of times that I'm the cheerleader. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't need to talk down to them or get mad at them, for lack of a better word. You know, they do that, unfortunately, good enough for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. I find that they need, you know, a little help on the other end as far as just recognizing that they're working very hard and trying to keep perspective. So what Mm. does working hard look like? Mm. What are some tips and resources that you pass on to these moms? Mm -hmm. What is a typical diet look like? What does exercise look like? Mm Because when you're pregnant, I'm assuming you're like, that's the last thing I want to do is get up and move and not just lay there and eat chocolate yes. because that's very appealing. I mean, yes. I do that. I'm not, right. I'm not even pregnant. So yeah. what do you say? What do you, mm-hmm. how do you motivate them to get up and, and, and change uh, essentially a lifestyle, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. And I think also, you know, kind of with the grieving process, part mm-hmm. of the grieving process is, you know, this may, might be a first pregnancy and, you know, maybe this patient was looking forward to like eating all those yes. foods that they were, you yeah. know, <gasps> wanting in pregnancy and, and right. that grieving process that, oh, I have to, you know, be so careful. That's mm-hmm. not fair. Yes. It's not fair. Yeah. So, yeah, as far as kind of general concepts that seem to help, and really, we really, I try to start general. Okay. And, you know, if some patients need a little bit more help than others, again, just because of their way the body is functioning. But, but generally, what I try to explain to patients is there's, you know, when we eat our foods, they're broken down into three macronutrients. They're broken down into carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. Okay? Mm-hmm. And of those, carbohydrates are the only ones that raise blood sugars. Mm. Okay? Mm-hmm. So with regards to the carbohydrates, they come from a variety of sources. And, you know, we need them. And especially in pregnancy, we can't mm-hmm. just cut them out. You know, mm-hmm. some patients mm-hmm. are like, can I just do no carb? And I'm like, well, no, you know, yeah. you have a baby that you're nourishing. So yeah. we need to. Not, not all carbs are evil. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, as far as the carbohydrates, you know, of course, we've got the breads and the rices, mm-hmm. you know, and patients forget that beans have carbohydrates as well. You know, oh. they're high fiber, but they also have carbohydrates. Oh, yeah. Fruits. All of those are, are healthy to mm-hmm. some extent, but mm-hmm. they all raise blood sugars, mm-hmm. even if they are healthy carbohydrates. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. the type of carbohydrate oftentimes makes a difference. 
So the whole grain carbohydrates seem to raise blood sugars less than the more refined. Mm -hmm. So rice is a big one for a lot of patients, you know, trying to choose maybe quinoa or brown rice. Mm -hmm. I have some patients that will try different types of rice, like hand pounded rice, red rice, you know. So I learn from my patients, you know, particularly my Indian patients have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I know a lot about Indian foods. Um, oh. I've never had them, but I know what they do to blood sugars, you wow. know. So, you know, different types of grains affect blood sugars differently. Sometimes the cooking preparation so even like French fries, right? If you eat a whole potato with the skin on, it's probably going to raise the blood sugars less than a French fry. Fruits, definitely, you know, the whole fruit is going to raise the blood sugar less than uh, mm -hmm. the juice. So things like that, you know. So interesting. Yeah. Just a little tweak here and there can yes, make a difference. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. And we do ask our patients to write down what they're eating because oh. they're going to find that there's certain foods that their blood sugar may be more sensitive to. And it doesn't always make sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've had patients tell me that, you know, they're trying very hard and they go buy a cauliflower crust pizza from Costco and they find that it spikes their blood sugars and then they go out and eat you know maybe a thin crust regular pizza and the blood sugar is okay I would say that's good news yeah, I, know. <laughs> I agree and I'm like great you know yeah. and that's the bottom line is you know we'll give you these guidelines but yeah. the, the bottom line is what works best for you so it sounds like you have to experiment a very little in so. the first so how long should you be experimenting yeah. like a month no no yeah <laughs> okay. unfortunately okay <laughs> Things move pretty quick in pregnancy, uh, yes. you know, especially in that, you know, late second, third trimester. Yeah. The baby's growing a lot. So the biggest risk of gestational diabetes is that sugar from the foods can cross over to the baby. Yes. The baby will start to store that sugar around the tummy in particular, and okay. that can make a vaginal delivery difficult. So in that second and third trimester, you know, if the blood sugars are high, you know, every week mm -hmm. the baby potentially is growing larger. Mm. So usually, uh, you know, we have a visit and try to follow up a week later. Mm-hmm. And in that week, that's the time to experiment. <laughs> okay. In but maybe even a day or two. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, Good you know, if know. you experiment and find the blood sugar is really high after pizza, then that means, okay, we either need to change the crust on the pizza. Yeah. You know, try maybe more vegetables, maybe add a big salad and have a little less pizza. Mm -hmm. Maybe take a walk. After that pizza, we know that if you can take a walk after you eat, it helps your body process that sugar so it doesn't cross over to the baby. Wow. So we can use it like medicine. And as far as type of activity, you know, walking is usually the most popular. A mm -hmm. lot of the, my patients will just walk in their house. And if they start getting back pain, I say, are you wearing tennis shoes? You got it. You know, they don't want to wear tennis shoes in their house. Right. Like you need good foot support if you're, you're right, walking. Right. Yeah. So those things can tend to help. Um, okay. as, as far as the other dietary tricks that we use, the type of carbohydrate, of course, adding protein. So, okay. you know, as I said, the vegetarian diets can be challenging mm -hmm. because they're low in protein mm -hmm. oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And of course, beans are a protein, but they can also raise blood sugars. So trying to balance all meals and snacks with protein, that could be mm -hmm. nuts, that could be, you know, avocado is more of a fat, but it mm -hmm. does tend to stabilize blood sugars. Peanut butter, we like peanut butter. Okay. Um, so almond butter, peanut butter, having that with an apple is like a really good snack. String cheese, those are all good protein sources that aren't meat, of course. Mm -hmm. And meat and eggs, we like eggs. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wow. I thought you would have a month. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It goes pretty quick. Wow. Um, you know, particularly the test is usually 24 to 28 weeks. And mm -hmm. so sometimes we may not see patients until, you know, 30 weeks or so. Mm -hmm. And then we've got, you, you know, got maybe eight time. or nine weeks. Wow. Yeah. I'm still not over that. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So you're saying the baby starts storing that mm -hmm. same type of sugar mm -hmm. in its belly. And you're saying that is hard when you have to give birth to this baby that's growing at a much faster rate than it's supposed to. Yes. What's been your largest baby? <laughs> Well, you know, I always tell my patients, I I don't see babies after delivery. Oh, you know, I right. see them okay. up until and then they're done. Yeah. They're done because yes. the gestational diabetes goes away. Go so they have no need of me as oh. soon as they deliver that baby immediately. Okay. Which okay. is pretty amazing. Yeah. So I don't know. Okay. Um, we've certainly had babies that, you know, that are measuring that are over measuring. 99th percentile. Yeah. We do ultrasounds for our higher risk patients that are, yeah. you know, high blood sugars monthly. Certainly seen some babies that are, you know, greater than 99th percent. Estimated fetal weight. Yeah, I think yeah. that was my son. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a big baby. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And what other issues can GD cause other than spiking spiking sugar, making, you know, having mm -hmm. a larger child? Yeah. What other issues can it trigger? Well, we do know that, and again, we can't do much about if you develop, we can try to prevent development of gestational diabetes, but just having gestational diabetes places your baby at a higher risk for developing diabetes as an adult. And again, there's not much we can do about that. I don't know if we know enough about the in utero and 
environment. I'd like to think Mm -hmm. that, you know, if we can keep that in utero environment healthier for baby, Mm -hmm. that that perhaps can reduce their risk. The things that we do know is that if mom's blood sugars are high around the time of birth, baby's more likely to experience low blood sugar at birth just because baby's producing more insulin to try Mm -hmm. to bring down that sugar from mom. Mm -hmm. And then once baby's born and producing too much insulin and no longer getting that sugar from mom, baby Mm -hmm. can have low blood sugar. And it can be pretty traumatic for the patients. I had a patient recently that said her first had low blood sugar. And I think she had said that her baby, you know, needed intervention and it was, you know, maybe up to seven days before her baby could finally come home. Oh, geez. Yeah. Um, and that was pretty, again, pretty traumatizing. Uh, sometimes the babies will develop jaundice or maybe some breathing problems mm-hmm. if mom's blood sugars have been too high. And those mm-hmm. are all treatable. Mm-hmm. So baby will go home healthy. It's just yeah. sometimes it means a longer stay to try to correct that. Yeah. What is your primary message to a mom that just... She didn't pass her glucose mm-hmm. test and this is this is all very new. What would what would you say to her if she was in your office? Yeah. You had a sign in your front room that you showed me, consult room to your clinic, and I can't remember what the saying was. I don't know if you know what it is, but it says something like you can do anything, basically. Yes. You're, you're, you're yeah. po- it's possible. Yes. Yeah. So I guess what I would say is, you know, first of all, take a deep breath. I think, you know, of course, again, it's easy for me to say because I'm not the patient. You know, I think a lot of patients, they're capable of it. And, you know, we really try to take away judgment. Mm -hmm. At least I do. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not there to shame the patient. I'm there to help the patient, you know, deliver a very healthy baby. It's a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, I'm not going to say that it's not a lot, but we do have tools and tips to try to make things easier. We will work with you. Yeah. Where you're at, you know, yeah. and most of us in the field, we're in it because we want to help the patient yeah. and we want yeah. a healthy baby on the other end. Yeah. And so understanding that, you know, if I don't have a patient that buys into the the plan, it's not going to be helpful for the patient. It's mm-hmm. not going to be helpful for the baby. So mm-hmm. I'm certainly there to meet the patient where they're at. Patients are capable of of doing these things. Yeah. It sounds like an opportunity for a lifestyle change, right? Yes. It could be a wake up call. It Absolutely. could be like... This is this should be on your radar yes. and probably feels daunting at the moment yes. because you're like, I'm having a baby and that yeah. changes my mm-hmm. life and things are going to change. But this might be a good you know, in some ways, a good warning sign of what is to come and how we need to just take care of our bodies better. Yes. And yes, to put a positive spin on it again, you know, usually it's not common for patients to have, you know, weekly visits outside mm-hmm. of pregnancy. Mm-hmm. And we know it takes a certain amount of time to make a new habit. So so if you want to put a positive spin on it, it really, this is the opportunity mm-hmm. to learn these habits and practice them. Right. You know, for some patients, it might be, you know, 20 weeks that they're practicing this. This mm-hmm. is definitely enough time to learn a new habit. You right. know, I, I don't right. know what they say anymore, but, you know, usually they say you need to do a habit a certain amount of times before it becomes... Yes. You know, it's a great opportunity. We can meet with the patients and do that cheerleading and, you know, do those baby steps to Mm -hmm. get where they need to get. Mm -hmm. And the good news is the patients will never need to be as strict with, you know, their diet and their exercises they are during pregnancy because they're Mm -hmm. not going to have that humongous load of hormones on board. But, you know, some of those things like just eating more whole grains, balancing it with protein, trying to Mm -hmm. get some regular physical activity, Mm -hmm. those can be really helpful and and certainly can prevent, at least help to prevent diabetes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, having gestational diabetes puts the patient at risk. If you look in the literature, you can see that, you know, if you have gestational diabetes, your risk of type 2 diabetes um, in the next maybe 15 years is maybe a 70 percent increased risk. Wow. But if you look a little closer, you'll see that, you know, if you are physically active, if you are overweight, losing about maybe five to 10 percent, mm-hmm. not necessarily reaching the BMI that your doctor might tell you you need to be at. Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. you know, again, five to 10 percent weight loss and maybe, you know, about 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity physical activity. That's maybe a 30 minute walk five days a week or, you know, even a smaller walk more frequently can reduce that risk quite a bit. Wow. You know, maybe wow. put you more like a 20 percent. Thank you so much. I've learned so much <laughs> because it's just so interesting. You know, as someone who's who, you know, might never experience pregnancy, th- this is all just really interesting. Just in the last month, April, I've had five people tell me they're pregnant. So <sighs> this is so good information. Yes. So because if they yes. don't pass their glucose yes. pill or test, yes. I could say this is what you do. Yes. Um, yes. Because it's so important. It, it could is. be I, I see it as an opportunity to go aha, I can, I need to change my lifestyle, not only for the stage in my life, but it's impacting someone else. Yeah. It's impacting someone else's health yes. and their future health. Absolutely. And I have an opportunity to 
turn the tide. I have an opportunity to make a difference. So yes. thank you so much for this information. So cool. Yeah. It, it's a, I love talking about it. It's, yeah. Uh, I, I love being in the field. And, and mm-hmm. again, it's just I love my patients. And yeah. I learn a lot from them and um, about just perseverance. Yeah. And, well, yeah. you're so encouraging. So <laughs> I'm not patient. I should go to you. But anyways, I'm sure um, you can give us some more links and, and literature so we can post on our sure. podcast. Thank you so much. Yep. I'm sure we'll have you back again. And thank you so much for spending time with me yeah, today. It was a pleasure. Thank yeah. you for having me. Yeah. For more information about 3W, please visit our website at 3wmedical.org. That's the number three, the letter W, medical.org. From there, you can learn more information about the services we provide. Book an appointment or make a donation if you'd like to support our mission. You can also call our office at 206-588-0311. That's 206-588-0311. If you like this episode, please share it with others and consider subscribing on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, stay healthy and be well.